this is a meeting of Senate Appropriations Committee. Uh, this afternoon, we're hearing from uh, representatives from our publicly funded higher education system. So we have University of Vermont here, the president, Garamella. Uh, we have the chancellor of the Vermont State uh, College System, Sophie Zatney, and we have Scott Giles, who is um, I, I, president, executive director, I don't know exactly, but of uh, Vermont Student Assistance Corporation. Um, and I see Sophie has Sharon Scott with her and um, President Garamella has Wendy Koenig and Scott Giles has Marilyn Cargill. So uh, we certainly have, um, we're very fortunate to have very uh, knowledgeable people joining us today. Uh, we were hoping um, last week we were talking about where we wanted to get more information. We've been looking at how we have appropriated CRF money uh, so we want to get sort of an update on how that money has uh, addressed needs. Uh, we also want to make sure that you can tell us that the amounts that you received uh, uh, you think will be expended, or in some cases may already have been expended, um, so that we don't have anything left by December 30th. And then the other is to get uh, really what it looks like today. Uh, which was hard to anticipate what enrollment would look like, the uh, effect of the pandemic on our higher ed um, uh, communities. And so uh, the committee was very interested in having um, all of you come and uh, brief us on those issues um, at, as you see the world right now. Um, so I'm going to, uh, I know that um, uh, we have information from UVM. Uh, we have um, do, uh, did we have other documents from VSAC I, and um, Vermont State College, Christy? Yes, we have a presentation from Vermont State College. Okay, so um, what I would like to do, uh, if we could, I'll start with, um, uh, why don't we start with the University of Vermont and then we'll move to the state college system and move to, um, uh, uh, VSAC, um, and then uh, people can ask questions as we go along, but then we can have some uh, discussion um, and um, sort of general conversation around uh, uh, the world of higher ed from the people who are right there experiencing it every day in terms of the impact, what you've done for health um, uh, prevention um, and so forth. So I'm going to start with the University of Vermont um, sheet. I know that we have uh, an expenditure. You provided a sheet. So if you want to just, um, you want to uh, want us to put that up on the screen, President Garamella, or or do you want to uh, uh, just give us a summary of what's on there? I'm happy to do it either way. Um, uh, Senator Kitchell, what, whatever you like. Well, why don't we start with just some general uh, comments from you in terms of a summary of the world as you see it. Um, um, from where you sit at the University of Vermont. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kitchell and, and all the senators and, and others who have joined this uh, call. Uh, the world as I see it, I, I don't think you want to know. But um, I, 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 first, I want to just congratulate everyone on, on, on this committee and uh, folks across the legislature and the governor's office. I think we are seeing various um, ways of operating during COVID across the nation. And uh, I'm very proud that I'm in Vermont today. I, I think you've all done a fantastic job uh, handling an unpredictable, uncertain um, situation uh, the best you can. And I think the results are speaking for themselves, uh, both in terms of use of care funding, being very careful with how you're budgeting, you know, in the quarter and all that, but also how we're uh, addressing COVID. So, um, truly, I, I, I feel very much like um, we, have, we have great partners in the governor's office, in the legislature, in, in the commissioner of health, uh, and certainly to Schneider and, and others who have put together this uh, safe opening plan. Certainly my colleagues, uh, Chancellor Daphne and, uh, and Scott Giles, who, uh, who runs Vermont from all I can tell. So um, it, just uh, briefly, uh, I'll, I'll summarize, and you have... What we did for you, Senator Kitchell, is to give you um, how we spent the allocation of just under $8.7 million in the uh, previous, I guess, 
before June. And so in FY20, uh, we had, uh, you know, technology and hardware uh, uh, expenses. Obviously, we had to go remote in, uh, in no time uh, and, and pivot right away. We had lots of additional compensation, leave and unemployment uh, items. Lots of equipment and supplies, you know, sanitizers and masks and all to buy. Um, and then a big expense for us in the spring was room refunds to students, uh, amounted to just really the, the lion's share of the, the funding that you provided, around $5 million. Uh, we, you know, refunds to students for parking, meal refunds for another two plus million dollars. So that added up to 8.69. You've got the, uh, the actual numbers in front of you in the table. I'm happy to answer, you know, uh, add to any of those. Um, we uh, then the next two uh, tranches that we described are uh, what's been happening since July 1st, the allocation through December 30th of 2020. Um, so we, we were provided, you know, $17.3 million in CARES funding uh, for the added COVID expenses, but an additional $2 million uh, for our Office of Engagement which of course also uh, is very timely in terms of uh, addressing issues which assist the state come out of COVID and cope with the challenges of COVID. So um, the, the amounts that we're using, we're putting the um, 17.3 million, uh, you know, what we're allocating it for. Again, the categories are the same. The, the technology, hardware and software is $2 million. We've done a lot. Every single classroom has cameras, has um, the ability to remote, you know, stream uh, the classes, et cetera. Again, additional compensation, tons and tons and tons, actually very large amounts of sanitizer and masks and plexiglass and all of that. Uh, testing has been very expensive. I think, I hope you've all uh, heard by now, seen by now that I truly believe that we at UVM have, um, probably the most comprehensive and aggressive plan for the return to campus in terms of testing, contact tracing, um, uh, distancing, de-densifying, isolation, quarantine, all of that. Um, it costs a lot of money, but I thought that providing an education to our students in a safe and healthy environment and protecting the health of our community as well as the, the surroundings, the neighbors, was very important. So we spared no expense. We, uh, our testing regimen is such that we test every student before they even set foot in our, in our community. And so um, the numbers are very, uh, you know, speak for themselves. And I'll, I'll come back to that. But the testing thing has been very expensive. Um, that's a big part of the expenditures we've put together. Additional financial aid. Our students, uh, their families have, uh, are, are in, are in dire straits often, and additional financial aid uh, requirements were there, facilities modifications and such. So that all adds up to 17.3. And then the, the Office of Engagement. I will give you a very brief separate update on where we are with that, if, if, if you would um, uh, want that. And then we've also projected our uh, expenses related to COVID from January through June of 2021. This is our spring semester. And that comes out to $12.2 million. Same category, slightly lower expenditures because we're hoping things are a little bit better. Of course, these are all unpredictable. So it's our best estimate. I also, at the very end, um, included expenditures that are COVID-induced. They're certainly worsened because of COVID. Um, uh, and, and that is our revenue shortfall. I understand CARES funding, per se, is not... Uh, meant for sort of lost revenue, but it is a very real cost for us. And uh, that's about $21 million that we put down there as context for you. I wanted um, your committee to be aware of how, um, how challenging financially the situation is this, this year. So, um, so essentially, I, I guess, in summary, I would say, um, we, we pre presented in the table how we spent the $8.6 million of FY20 funding, um, how we're using the 17.3 uh, FY21 funding, including the, in addition, uh, the 2 million for our Office of Engagement and our projected needs beyond that. So the major uses 
for the FY20 money was refunds. Um, in 21, the expenditures are COVID testing, expanded technology, et cetera. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions on testing and such. You know, I will say, and you should all, I hope it'll reassure you all that our testing, um, while extremely rigorous, is the results are also extremely gratifying. We've had about, we've received about 5,000 tests from our pre-arrival testing so far. Um, this is through Vault Health and Rutgers. And we've had five positive, five out of 5,000, and those five have stayed away. So we prevented five people from COVID from coming to the state, but essentially 4,995 were clear and, and, and will be coming to campus. The others will isolate where they are and come. And then we're doing on-campus testing broad uh, through the Broad Institute, which is a highly regarded um, uh, collaboration between MIT and Harvard. And we've had on the order of 15, 16, 1700 tests so far. And again, the positivity rate is like 0 0.1, 0.2%, something like that. So essentially 99.9% .9 of our students uh, we found were COVID free to start with. And then when they came here, we double checked and they remained COVID free. So I've it's not meant to be um, provocative in any means, but I think that our students uh, are the most tested and and perhaps the most COVID free of anyone in Vermont. And so they, they, they stand more of a chance of picking it up in Vermont than than what uh, what they come in with. So I'm just very pleased that this this testing regimen is working. We're going to be testing them every week for the next few weeks. We'll gather a lot of data. Uh, along with Dr. Mark Levine and Jan Carney and others, we'll look at that data and see if we need to um, stick with the same weekly testing, which is quite likely, or increase or decrease the frequency of testing. So again, a lot of expense, but I believe that um, is uh, warranted and it keeps our community free. Um, so I have a question um, yeah. uh, um, for you. Um, the news has certainly uh, been troubling with the startup of many of the colleges and universities around the country. We have two UVM grads, um, Senator Ash and uh, Senator Sears, and I'm sure they never partied while they were at UVM. Um, but um, others, I'm, uh, I'm sure they just, you know, stuck to their studies, particularly Senator Ash. So my question um, is, how um, how are you going to handle if in fact, um, because uh, we know um, when you're young, you're immortal and sometimes you take risks. So the, uh, the question I have is uh, um, uh, how you would manage th that kind of normal uh, student behavior in this environment. Yeah. And yeah. Maybe, maybe students, you've got the advantage of the startup of other colleges where they've seen that actually it has meant the difference whether they are on campus or whether they are all off on remote um, uh, learning. So it may, in fact, maybe that experience is help sort of brought home the reality of it. Um, but I was just wondering, and then we can talk about the yeah. same because I believe some of the state colleges, uh, colleges are gonna have some in-person uh, classes as well. Yeah, it's, it's a great question, Senator Kitchell. So certainly, have benefited from the experience of other colleges. I speak to the uh, presidents across New England um, almost on a weekly basis. Very often we compare notes and for and folks, presidents of universities across the country. You know, I just read this morning, it almost seemed like a typo to me, but UNC, I believe, had a 30%, 33, 0% positivity among their students. We have 0.1%. And so like Jan Carney said in her inimitable way on Vermont this week, this weekend with Stuart Ledbetter, uh, he'd interviewed Jan Carney and um, Dr. Mark Levine and Patty Freelock. She said, we're not, this is Vermont, this is not North Carolina and we're UVM, we're not UNC. And so there is an enormous difference between the two. Um, but to your first question, which is very uh, pertinent, it's, it's occupied most of my time and my thinking over the last many weeks and especially yeah, given people like Senator Ash who are so uh, careful and good about uh, these things, not everyone can be like him. Um, there <laughs> are challenges with this. I think that my worry was most about, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. For those of you who can't see uh, the screen, Senator Ash is showing his uh, true colors. 
myself. Um, <laughs> the University of Vermont teacher. Um, so, oh, he's got a shirt for all occasions. <laughs> he wears the same shirt every time, really. Or, I, I, or a book. I, <laughs> or a book. <laughs> Great. So um, we put a lot of effort into this, and we're actually very regularly updating and evolving our plan too. Um, I will tell you that uh, Mayor Weinberger has been a great uh, partner. Uh, I spoke with the city council earlier this week, and you know he suggested some important things which we've adapted in our planning. So the bottom line is overwhelmingly, so we provided an at-home option, Senator Kitchell, as you know, and said anyone who's uncomfortable coming back is, a, is welcome to stay away. Um, as of today, the numbers are around 1,800 students, 1-8, 1 1,800 students that chose the at-home option. Um, and so uh, those that came, so many of them we know are writing to each other saying, look, I'm working with my roommates to make sure we don't allow anyone to come into our room. And so they all want this to succeed. You even, there was a fair amount of reporting yesterday with the move-in. And I think on the whole, you see that these students really want things to work. Of course, there have been also cases of um, reports from the community on, um, on what appears to be COVID, uh, you know, not, not responsible behavior. And so we're, not only are we doing educational, um, focusing on that side of things, our student leaders, our medical students, our nursing students, there are all these peer um, education, peer pressure type of programs we have, but we also are being extremely explicit and clear about the sanctions and about the enforcement. So if we find egregious violations and they're reported to us or we, we get access to that in any way, we will find them, hefty fines, or if the behavior is egregious enough, they'll be suspended. We're not going to um, hesitate about this. It's a question of life and death, truly, and, and the life of our neighborhood, uh, the, the neighbors. So I think the message is getting out loud and clear. We provided a simple, um, sort of a very easy to fill in web link on our neighbors facing page, on, on our return to campus webpage, where any neighbor can simply click on that site. It's a web-based, drop-down menu-based um, reporting uh, tool where they can say where it's happening, what's happening, provide some detail, and we're following up right away. The follow-up has been quite gratifying too. Um, those addresses, and you know this, there are there's a small number of addresses at which these things happen. There were 26 or so our community relations team, which actually Wendy Koenig leads, um, uh, wrote to the landlords, wrote to the, uh, the students at, the, at those places. And they were, as far as I, uh, my, my recollection is, only two repeat um, off offenses happened. And several of the students wrote apology notes and such. So we're being very, um, I guess, hands-on about this. We're also funding at the mayor's request, um, COVID educational circuits so that uh, we're able to go as something is happening, ticket them, and we've asked the police to let us know if the violations were COVID-related, in which case we follow up as well. So it's a very, um, it's obviously a carrot and the stick. Uh, I do think the carrot works for 9,500 of the 10,000 students or 9,900. Um, for those who need the, the, the enforcement part, we are not hesitating at all. So this is serious. I certainly don't want 10 students to force us to close. We're doing the same with Greek um, houses, fraternities and sororities. I can tell you that their parent organizations are also being extremely serious about this. They have rules. They're supposed to wear masks in public areas within their houses, um, follow all these rules, not have rush events. They're all virtual events, et cetera. So I could go on for a long time about this, but there's a lot of thought that went into it. And, and I, um, I, I welcome any input from anyone as well um, on this on this group. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. That's a um, pretty thorough um, update on yeah. actions to date. Um, right. Unless the committee has some specific questions, maybe it's good to go and see what uh, have uh, the chancellor brief us on what is happening um, at the state mm -hmm. colleges um, and the campuses. And I, I <clears throat> see that you have Sharon uh, with you as well. I don't think I mentioned that Sharon was. Uh, maybe I did. I don't know. I'm zoomed out. Um, so uh, thank you, Sophie, for coming today and um, bringing us up to date. I know you've got some 
additional challenges that um, uh, you're trying to manage. And so it's um, a sort of trial by fire, but would appreciate uh, getting an update from you as well. Yes, yeah, certainly. We did um, provide a presentation to Chrissy, but I think given how valuable your time is and hearing that you're zoomed out, I don't think we need to go through our, our whole presentation. Um, the, the key points, just to follow up in, in terms of what uh, President Garamella was saying, assuming that's sort of what you're interested in, um, as far as our CRF funds go, uh, we received uh, 12215 um, million for FY20, and those funds have largely been expended. Um, and we received um, 15, uh, mil just over 15 million for FY21, which have to be expended by the end of the month, by the end of um, December. And we're working on uh, funding those projects. And again, most of those I could run through the categories, but they're going to be very similar to the ones President Garamella listed out in terms of testing and equipment and facilities modification, uh, you know, remote instruction costs, et cetera. So I'm not gonna run through all of those. Um, so really for us, the focus is on the bridge funding. So again, we're extremely appreciative for what we've already received. We did receive um, that additional CRF dollars for FY20, and that was extremely helpful to us to ending FY20 uh, positive. We don't have the final number yet, but we're anticipating we will have a carry forward of approximately 4 million from FY20. Um, and again, in large part due to the additional funding that we received from the legislature and, and the governor and that included room and board refunds and things like that. So um, we're coming into FY21 um, with a carry forward of approximately 4 million. Uh, you've already given us um, a 5 million in bridge funding general funds for FY21 in your first quarter transitional budget, and then an additional 7.5 million in CRF funds um, to be used as bridge. And those we're working um, to spend as, as creatively as we can uh, within the, the guidance um, and we're, we're working you know, closely with the Joint Fiscal Office and, <clears throat> and checking to make sure that uh, what we're spending it on is, is uh, legitimate. So our ask is um, 40.3 million in terms of what we're anticipating need for this year. But when you take into account the 4 million carry forward that we have from FY20 um, and then the 5 million in, in bridge we already received, the 7.5, in CRF um, bridge money, that brings us to 23.8 moving forward that we're seeking um, in bridge funding. And that obviously assumes that we have the roll forward of our base appropriation. Um, and again, we, we did receive our first quarter of that already, but assuming that that remains the same uh, moving forward, that's the sort of bottom line of what we're, we're asking for right now. So I don't know if anyone has any questions specifically on the, the bridge or the CRF funds. Um, because we could talk about that first, or I can switch over to talking about um, COVID and the fall semester, if you would prefer me to do that. Yeah, well, we can go on to that. I think what, it, what you're saying is the legislature made a commitment um, for this bridge funding and to help us uh, really do the planning and, and get a path forward to stabilize the state college system. So uh, we have $23 million yet to figure out committee. That's what I'm, uh, I think that's really the heart of what's being said here. The Senate added the seven and a half when we did the uh, uh, quarter budget. Um, I know that the chancellor's office has, uh, has identified ways that we can uh, use that money um, uh, that would be permissible or working toward using all of it. So um, uh, that's, that's what is still out there for us to, um, uh, address um, to fulfill that commitment, mm -hmm. that bridge year uh, that um, the chancellor is referencing. So just keep that in mind um, as we uh, move forward. But that's a very helpful breakdown, um, Sophie, to, um, to walk through with people how, what the total amount was in the end, because that was somewhat undefined uh, a few months ago. And then uh, uh, how you ended up the year and and what we've done so far to date. Um, so we've done some, but um, we're not quite there. So thank you. I think we can then move on in terms of uh, sort of where the landscape as it relates to uh, uh, the campus life and the decisions, which may vary uh, depending on um, <clears throat> depending on the institution. I'm not sure. So 
unless there are questions about the money for the state college system. Mm -hmm. The governor has proposed, it's on his list, it's sort of a waterfall if CRF is found eligible. I've been storming my brain working with Steve Klein and not hitting a brick wall, but I haven't given up yet. So um, in terms of how we can utilize our CRF um, um, uh, pot of money. And um, so that's uh, where that currently stands. Senator Ash and then Senator Starr. Um, so I, it gets to this issue of what you're calling a waterfall um, if I guess this is a question for Sophie, if with the governor's current proposal, let's assume that nothing changes and the federal government doesn't make the funds eligible under his proposal, what would happen to the state college system then? If we, if we don't receive the additional 23.8 million in bridge, is that yes. a question? If the um, governor's proposal, if the governor's proposal to use CARES funds doesn't come to fruition because the federal government doesn't change its policies. If we adopt the budget as is, what would happen next? Uh, what would happen next is that once the legislative session wrapped up is that we would um, work with our board to decide what steps we need to take, but those would be uh, significant and dramatic steps. Um, because again, we've, we're looking at a significant budget deficit and I would just, echo back to what President Garamella said, uh, you know, we anticipate this is going to be a year long impact for COVID. So we, you know, that's why our, our deficit is so serious looking um, because the spring is also, I think, going to be impacted by COVID just as the fall was. We obviously have the structural deficit as well. And we don't have, um, you know, we won't have the reserves or anything else to, to see us through. I mean, we, you know, <laughs> We, uh, we're, we're operating you know, on, on the edge. So if we don't have bridge funding, then it will result in significant, um, significant action that will be taken, I would imagine, along the scale of what was proposed back in April. It may be different to what was proposed in April, but it would be something significant along those lines. Well, I think we're all hopefully moving in the same positive direction across the branches and with the state college system. But I do hope that the various campuses understand the status quo proposal from the administration and what it means because the legislature always gets <clears throat> suckered into these dynamics where if we want to guarantee the funds, it means we have to cut funds to the tune of the exact same amount from the rest of the budget, meaning that the people who are in the state college community see the money on a spreadsheet and say, oh, great, it's there for us, even though they, it's not reasonable to ex assume that they will know the federal guidelines, and then puts us in the position of being the, the bad people of having to undo other people's appropriations in order to come up with the money. And I just think it's important that at a time when sort of public policy literacy is very low, that public budgeting literacy, which is also very low, that we all do a good job of communicating what's really on the line. Um, because we're, I mean, we've walked, this is like a Charlie Brown, you know, kicking the football situation for the legislature and it's crossed other governors as well. This is not a new tactic, but puts us in a very challenging position. And I guess I just offer that you don't need to respond and let Bobby ask his question. Uh, I, I would just simply say to Senator Ash, we asked the administration, uh, what would be the fallback? And they didn't have an option B. So, uh, but I, I want to again state that from a <laughs> legislative perspective, I think we have made, made it clear mm -hmm. that we are very committed um, to seeing the system stabilized. How we will do it, um, the pressure that it's putting on us to um, figure out because it, that's it seems like that's where the gorilla is landing, um, is something that um, we're going to have to work very hard on. Because um, the only response from the budget, as it's been presented to us, is the uh, possibility that CRF money can um, be the source of the 23 million. So I, uh, that's that's the reality of where we are now. Um, and I, I guess I'll go on to. Um, Senator Starr, and then I think Senator Sears has his blue hand up. So Senator Starr. 
Yes, uh, thank you, Salfi. Uh, of course, the 23.8 million is very important to our to our uh, universities, and uh, and I, you know, fully support uh, working to try to raise this. I'm wondering uh, what your fiscal year is, and um, could and how much money if we used. Uh, CRF funds, how much you could use in be, by December 31st, which is the deadline for those funds um, of that 23.8, if we, if we could get that freed up and you could uh, use it, how much of it could you use by the end of this calendar year to cover um, your 21 shortfall. Yeah, so our fiscal year runs through to June 30th of, uh, of next year. Um, and we are trying to be creative in what we can use CRF funds for. But again, as I mentioned, we've received, for which again, we're extremely grateful, we have received a lot in CRF funds already. So we already have those monies to use up by the end of the year. Um, we have the, the just over 15 million in CRF funds uh, to cover the cost, the testing, the, the PPE, all those things. We have the 7.5 already that's bridge funding that we're trying to be creative in what we can do, but um, it, it is a challenge. And if we if it came to us all as bridge funding, um, right now it, it would be a, a real challenge to know how we would deal with that. One of the challenges is that, um, again, as I think was mentioned, is we really, you, Right now, as we understand it, we can't use those funds to replace lost revenue. And that's really where our deficit is coming from, is lost revenue. And we have a lot of fixed costs that aren't COVID related, um, you know, that are salaries and benefits and, you know, carrying costs and all those things. So um, it's it's a real challenge to know how we would do that. We're, we're open to being as creative as we can, but I think there's probably gonna be limits to our creativity um, with res with respect to the entire amount that we're that we're seeking, <clears throat> but if your lost revenues are created and caused by COVID, I don't see why you couldn't uh, you couldn't use that to a maximum. It depends on the institution and the nature of the organization uh, with the CRF money. That's the problem, Bobby. So yeah. that's that's the that's the litmus test as it relates to businesses, but um, uh, I, I, it's not um, it's not quite as transferable to um, higher ed or some other or to state government, for example, yeah. or municipal government. Um, you can't make up those lost revenues. So that that is the challenge: is if we don't have more flexibility or some of my. Um, ideas uh, don't come to fruition, then uh, what, how do we formulate plan B? So with that, I'm gonna to move to Senator Sears. Senator Sears, are you? Yes, you're muted. You're muted again. I know I mute and unmute myself. It's just really a harrowing experience here on Zoom. Um, <laughs> nice to meet you, Chancellor. Um, nice to meet you as well. And please take my my comments the way they're meant, not to disparage the state college system, which I have the greatest respect for. I represent Bennington County. We just lost one of our major employers in one of our great schools, which was Southern Vermont College. Um, it's now in bankruptcy again, um, and they're trying to sell the property and I'm sure somebody will get it for something way under the value, just as they did with Green Mountain College in Pulteney. So I'm fully uh, understanding of the need for, um, even just as an economic driver, to keeping those colleges and university open. I'm also very happy with our relationship with the Castleton Nursing School with the uh, Community College of Vermont down here. So I don't want to see that change, but I see us between a rock and a hard place here. If anybody who's been around our appropriations committee very long 
thinks there's 23.8 million in discretionary spending in this three quarter budget. Um, I don't know where it is. You know, usually, you know, we have debt service, we have state employees contracts, we have all kinds of obligations that are there. And so as you try to find discretionary spending, you may have to look at VSAC. You may have to look at UVM. You may have to look at healthcare. Those are the places that we'd be stuck with because of the way the governors <coughs> set this up. So I guess my biggest concern would be what have the consultants that we paid said about this 23.8 million? And do they have advice for us? Is a portion of it real that could be COVID funds? Is it a uh, half of it? Uh, um, can we get something from those consultants on this uh, governor's proposal? So the, the consultants you're referring to, uh, consultants to the legislature in terms of the ability to spend CRF funds? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not familiar with, with them. I mean, our number comes, our 40.3 million that we started with comes out of the uh, report that we had from Jim Page that the Joint Fiscal Office yeah, had that, requested, right. and then from the state uh, treasurer's report. I'm not arguing with the amounts, I'm just, and I'm not actually not against saving our Vermont State Colleges. I'm just wondering where anybody, where we would find 23.8 million, and have we consulted with the consultants? Has Joint Fiscal looked at this? What are our options? So we are working with joint fiscal um, to come up with and explore ideas to be as creative as we can on this. Uh, we are also taking measures to contain costs internally. Um, you know, so, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're trying to do the best we can, um, yep. you know, to make sure that we're not uh, asking you to pay for things unnecessarily. Um, but again, we are looking closely um, at what others are doing um, other colleges and universities. Uh, we're keeping a close eye on the U.S. Treasury guidance. I mean, that's, and again, even if the timeline was expanded, right now we're looking at this end of December timeline. If that were extended to the spring, that would help enormously because it would address COVID-related costs and expenses for the spring as well. Um, so, and we, and we again, I, I, I just want to be clear, we fully understand how challenging this is uh, for the legislature. And I understand that it's, you know, it's not a lack of, desire to help the VSC, it's a, a question of really challenging choices that you're confronting and, and limited dollars to, to address all the need that's out there. And we do recognize that. Thank you. Other questions of the chancellor? Um, um, okay, and could you just brief us in terms of the startup um, and which um, uh, institutions are uh, having in-person learning um, and how that is working? Uh, or maybe the students haven't returned yet, I'm not sure. No, we're, we're well underway. So Castleton University and Northern Vermont University started last week. Uh, Vermont Tech started earlier this week and the Community College of Vermont starts, I believe it's um, September 8th. So we're, we kind of have a spectrum. Um, uh, the Community College of Vermont decided back in June. Um, and again, each college, we worked with them, it was collaborative, but each college looked at what the needs were for their particular students, uh, their faculty, their, their technical capabilities, etc. Um, and so the Community College of Vermont made the decision in June to switch to being uh, online. They have a small handful of courses that will involve some face-to-face -face labs, art, art classes, things like that. They're offering a range of uh, virtual learning options, synchronous, asynchronous, accelerated. They have a, a smorgasbord of different uh, options, but, but essentially most of it is going to be remote. Um, Castleton University is um, providing remote instruction for the fall. They do have nursing that will be obviously doing some practical hands-on with nursing. Um, they do have students back on campus. Um, I believe they have approximately 300 um, that are in person. They have a, um, a lot that are commuters. Uh, they also have additional students, uh, graduate students that live in downtown Rutland and they have students um, part of the Killington program. Um, so they, they have some students back, but the courses will primarily be um, remote. Uh, Vermont Tech is 
is has some students living on campus. I don't remember the exact number for them. Um, those will be on all, campus all semester. And again, those tend to be students that are out of state, um, international, or have housing insecurity that, or inability to access uh, courses remotely. And then they're looking at doing a um, low residency uh, program. Given that Vermont Tech, a lot of it is hands-on and experiential, they will be having students coming at different points during the semester for intensive week at a time labs and, and hands-on. Um, so that's a, a new model that uh, we will be trying out this semester. And then at Northern Vermont University, they're, they're providing both in-person instruction and, and some remote. And the numbers are, they have just under 6% of their courses will be online. 48% are fully face-to-face and 62% are a combination of face to face with some hybrid, some remote. And, and again, just to go to what President Garamella was saying about the experience in Vermont, at NVU, for example, I believe they've tested, done over 3,200 tests at this point, and they've had zero positives. Now, many of our students are Vermonters, so that, I'm sure that contributes to it, but we are also testing students at all our colleges, um, you know, as they come in, day, day zero, day seven, um, and then depending on the amount of face-to-face -face interactions is really driving the amount of testing moving forward. Um, but at Northern Vermont University, for example, they will be doing regular uh, testing uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, so yeah, we're, we're also taking it. And, and the other question that had come up earlier was um, how to handle situations where students aren't complying with the pledges that they've, they've committed to. And um, I can tell you already that we've had students that have been sent home that haven't complied. We're taking a, a very strict view of it. Uh, we've also been working closely with the towns in which we're located. Um, I know Castleton, for example, um, just passed an order limiting the size of gatherings in the town. So they're taking advantage of the governor's um, you know, directive permitting towns to take action to help address off-campus activity as well. Uh, so we are working closely with our local communities uh, also with our local um, police departments, et cetera, to try and curb off-campus behavior <laughs> as well as on-campus behavior. Senator Westman, you have a question? Um, so early on, um, the reports were that schools across the country were going to see a 20% drop-off in students. What have we experienced at the state colleges? Um, in the number of students that have dropped off in, in the students that are um, that you expected initially um, going to school. Yeah, so um, our residential colleges have definitely seen a decrease in enrollment, and it ranges from approximately 11% 11, 11 um, up to, I think it's 23%. Um, the Community College of Vermont routinely anticipates a decline in enrollment. Um, they are seeing a much stronger uh, you know, stronger enrollment than they had anticipated. They had anticipated a decrease. I don't know if it um, means that they're above where uh, level with last year, but they've, they've had a strong enrollment. They had a strong summer. Um, obviously for us, even with those enrollment decreases, the revenue implications are, are, are larger than that because of having uh, so many fewer students actually on campus. And so our revenue largely comes from about 78% of our revenue comes from students in the form of tuition, room and board and fees. So even if we have, um, you know, the enrollment numbers aren't catastrophic, we, we're still having uh, significant revenue implications because we're having so many fewer students actually on campus. So it has an impact on the room and board aspect of, of revenue. So is there any way that um, we um, um, could get um, some sort of a report back from you on who's the 11, who's the 23, and how that breakdown through the system is? Yeah, we can follow up and provide you with that. Um, I did have one more follow-up question. Um, okay. As we talk about the bridge funding and having to come up with the 23 million in that, I don't think we can do that. And this might not be the place to do it because it's a longer question, but some um, idea of, um, what, where we are in the system in making changes, because I think we all know that um, it, we can do the bridge funding, but if nothing changes in the system, 
um, we're going to be right back where we are now in, um, in a year from now. Mm -hmm. So the question really is, um, um, what is the system doing to change? And for those of us that don't spend all of our time dealing with this, um, how do we get the update and how do we understand what's happening? You know, uh, I think that would be helpful to just revisit our own legislation on that that created the select committee. And then within that, it's a steering committee that um, uh, I understand um, uh, the chair is um, Joyce Judy. Yep. And um, they're gonna select the contractor who is going to provide the consultation and the body of knowledge and expertise um, to help the steering committee. And I, I understand, and Senator Ash can confirm this, um, that the Senate appointee to that committee is um, Senator Baruth. And um, so we're really relying on that structure. And then um, to also because the campuses, and I'm stating this because I wanna make sure I, I have a clear understanding. And then there, and there are uh, committees that have been created around the various campuses mm -hmm. and uh, community um, leaders and so forth. And that, that uh, uh, thinking and work would then feed into that steering committee. I think it's 15 members um, mm -hmm. in total. And I don't think, um, probably it's, I know that the, um, the, um, the select committee probably hasn't met. The steering committee I know is meeting because they're having to review the vendors and make a decision and, and possibly they have by now. Um, I'm not aware of it. So if any of our witnesses have got the latest update, that would be helpful as well. But that's, I think we should ask um, our Senate representation um, to keep us up to date because it's such a critical um, process and the work and the timing is so critical. <laughs> I, I, I understand that, but I do know that each of the schools, and, I, and you're probably as aware as I am of Northern Vermont University, they had a, um, uh, their committee, which is pretty much wrapped up its report to go. So I, I'm just trying to figure out how to um, sort through where we are with everything. So um, Sophie, has it, do you know, to your knowledge, or uh, Senator Ash, to your knowledge, do you know if a contractor has been selected by um, that steering committee? I know that I was invited to a meeting on Monday. I'm a member of the, 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 the select uh, committee, and we've been invited to a meeting Monday afternoon, at which I believe we'll be told about the, the contractor. So I, I don't know for sure. I just know that we're going to be receiving an update, and my sense is the update will include um, you know, who the, the contractor is on. So, and Scott is on that committee as well as, uh, well That's as true. President Garamella. So, yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, other questions um, of the chancellor? Otherwise we can move on to um, BSAC and um, Scott, I also see, um, I don't see his face, but I see th uh, that uh, Tom Little is joining us as well. So just want to welcome uh, Tom. Uh, thank you very much. And um, um, Senator Kitchell, before I start, um, I just want to be mindful of your time. So I will kind of skip part of what I thought that I would present um, and then come, come, come back to questions. But um, let me begin, I think, echoing what Suresh and what Sophie have both um, said is, you know, our appreciation for the attention that the Appropriations Committee has given uh, to higher education um, and to the needs both of the institutions and of our students, and in particular, um, you know, express my appreciation for the work that you did with us the begin, you know, early this spring when we came to you and said that without some clarity regarding the FY21 funding levels, we couldn't make awards. And I, I just want to, I know that was challenging, but we, on behalf of all of us at VSAC, thank you for uh, working with us to make those commitments. Um, of the 19.9 million in base funding you gave us, we've already obligated close to 17 of that. Um, and, you know, we are still obviously in late, late August. Uh, I thought I'd take a minute on the higher ed picture, then talk about our COVID funding and, you know, kind of provide you an update with what we have done and where we are. Um, one thing that I, I do want to make clear, and, and in this regard, again, I'm echoing the comments that Suresh and Sophie have made. Um, this has been a year of unparalleled collaboration within the higher education community. 
And as I take a look at um, not only the work that BSAC is doing with the institutions of higher education, but the work that they are doing in order to figure out how to bring students back on campus safely, uh, the Vermont presidents are meeting weekly um, to talk about their experience and to share plans. Uh, UVM, the state colleges, Middlebury have all you know, really contributed both their leadership um, and their resources to make sure that all institutions um, have the benefit of the work that they're doing. And you know, I think we all owe them a, a debt of gratitude. Uh, from a student perspective, um, you know, this will come as no surprise. This has been a challenging year you know, for everyone. Um, there's been a great deal of volatility in student attitudes. Um, the transition um, of high schools from you know, in-person to remote created its own set of challenges, particularly for students that were undecided or were late deciders towards the end of the spring. Summer melt is normally a problem that we see, you know, we're 11 to 15% of students, high school seniors who claim they'll be on campus in the fall don't show up. And we're seeing some evidence of greater levels of melt in part because this K-12 system had to focus very much on meeting core academic needs during this transition period. And while we were able to step in and, you know, kind of backstop some of that work, um, we saw a decline in financial aid filings, both at the national level and at the state level. Um, one of the things that we did with, as a result of the resources that you provided us, um, and in part in response to um, something that Senator Westman shared, uh, in March when we were last talking, national surveys suggested that upwards of 30% of high school seniors that otherwise would have gone on to school were considering not um, enrolling for the fall or deferring for a year. Um, we went out to survey Vermont financial aid filers, um, kind of both in late June and then in early July. And I, I can provide more detail about this at another time, but one of the things I do want to um, acknowledge is that I think that the schools were in a very, very tough position. Um, when we surveyed Vermont um, financial aid filers, 90% of the first year students and 85% of the returning students said that they planned to enroll as normal. But as soon as you talked about online modality, those numbers changed pretty dramatically and students started indicating that they were more likely than they would have otherwise uh, to defer a semester or a year. And we saw upwards of 20% of the uh, financial aid filers indicating that they might defer if um, online was the only mode that was available to them. Um, not surprisingly, there are lots of equity issues buried in there that I can talk about um, another time. Um, the other thing that we took a look at was the economic impact that COVID-19 was having on our students. And again, um, one of the things that we have seen is that the economic impact of COVID, much like the economic impact of the last recession, breaks down along education lines um, and along gender lines. So female students were more likely to report um, the loss of work. Um, first gen students were more li likely to report um, temporary work stoppage than second gen students um, and probably not surprisingly dependent students more than, more than independent. One of the things that we were tracking was that students with kind of multiple COVID-19 related financial events we're less likely to en enroll. Um, and later on, we'll be sharing some updated information because we redid this survey in late July, kind of early August, um, that has kind of shown that the strategies that the schools have been using by and large, I think has been successful in shifting the kind of desires of, of Vermont students. Um, but it, I think, speaks to the challenges that they face as they have you know, faced competing pressures with regard to how they offer education in the state. Um, so let me turn now kind of quickly to our CARES Act money that you all provided to us um, and offer it, you know, kind of upfront that one of the challenges that we faced similar to what Sophie and Suresh have indicated is that there were limitations on the way that COVID-19 money could be used um, that prevented us from doing some of the things that we would have liked to have been able to do. Um, Earlier this year, you appropriated 5.2 million in COVID-19 funds to support two goals. One was uh, to provide a replacement for the some advancement grant funds 
um, that we had provided been provided last year as kind of one-time funds. And 4.6 of which was provided in order to allow us to kind of handle the appeals of grant recipients whose income had changed as a result of COVID-19. And um, in a normal period, if there were no, you know, no strictures or limitations on those funds, and we were to receive 5 million additional dollars, we would have looked at probably raising levels for everyone, but there was no way that we could justify that as being a COVID-19 related expense. So the targeting of these funds is targeted on individual student level uh, COVID-19 impact. Um, we gave you an estimate when you came to us based on our prior experience in the Great Recession um, and based on information that we you know, were seeing from economists within the state regarding unemployment. Um, in our past experience that when students appeal because of economic circumstances, the grant goes up by 3,000. And based on our early June unemployment estimates, um, we expected that maybe 1,000 to 1,500 students would appeal. Um, we have currently received about 775 appeals at this point. Uh, 640 of those have been reviewed. Um, there are about 140 that are, are pending. 92% um, of these have resulted in increased awards. So we have, of the 4.6 that you provided, at this point, um, awarded 1.2 million of that. Uh, to roughly 500 students. Um, we've also awarded from base funding an additional 300,000 um, for students who have appealed, but we can't tie that directly back to COVID. So um, we are absorbing that within the, the base funding. If nothing else changes, and there are no changes in the way these funds can be utilized, we're projecting that we'll use a little less than 2 million of that 4.6. Um, and I offer the caveat, um, if there's additional flexibility in its use, or there is a second wave that results in new unemployment or loss of income, obviously some of this could change. Um, but we wanted to give you kind of the best kind of projection um, that we could, um, you know, kind of based on what it is that we are seeing right now. In addition to that, um, as you recall, you um, provided an additional five million dollars um, that. Uh, in part was, I think, placed there against the possibility that any or all of our estimates regarding need were off by a substantial amount. Um, when we received that $5 million originally, we proposed three uses of funds, uh, technology stipends, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about in a minute, replacement of summer work for students that lost the ability to work, um, and relief for student loan borrowers who are unable to make payments. We came back to the committee just to check whether or not those um, uses aligned with um, your intentions when you uh, provided the appropriation and decided that we would proceed with the technology stipend but put the other two potential uses on hold. And um, in communication with the two committee chairs, we said that we were comfortable awarding up to roughly a million dollars uh, depending on, on the need. So I thought what I would do is report back on that. Uh, colleges and universities um, had some of the same challenges when they made that quick move to remote in March uh, that the K-12 system did, particularly with technology. Um, many of the um, low-income students and first-generation students that we were both serving lacked the technology to be able to make that uh, transition smoothly. And in conversations with the financial aid team at CCB, they estimated that roughly 30% of their Pell Grant recipients lacked some of the technology that they needed to make that transition. And in late spring, we were able to step in um, to meet some of that need by creatively using our emergency microgrant program. Um, but as this unfolded and it was clear that the demand was higher, um, we sought permission to use some of the COVID-19 money for these purposes. Uh, we went out to college financial aid offices to ask them to nominate students. Um, and we originally received um, 5,000 nominations for these $1,000 stipends. Obviously, that was substantially more than the million dollars that we had indicated, at least initially, that we were comfortable you know, awarding. So we've gone back and done some triaging to prioritize those students that are the lowest income within the pools 
um, that were nominated. Um, we have awarded 760,000 to about 760 students. Just, just a second, Scott. Um, yeah. President Garamella says he's got to sign off. So I just want to acknowledge that um, he's leaving. Um, we appreciate his uh, spending the time with us this afternoon. I assume Wendy is going to stay on. And uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Any question. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Therese. So, sorry, Scott. Okay. No, no. Um, we expect those numbers will continue to rise. Um, we just received 1,800 additional students nominated from CCB. Um, and, you know, our experience has been that the, the response rate in this process runs between 10 and 15 percent. And if nothing changes, we'll expect to commit a little bit more than the million dollars that we had originally talked about, which will leave the additional $4 million either to be allocated towards one of the other uh, kind of programs that we had proposed or for other uses as the committee. So I, I'm it. not clear, Scott, um, um, is the need to, particularly with remote learning and CCV mm -hmm. is remote and the hybrid courses and so forth that are out there, um, is there a need for more, to uh, allocate more than the million dollars to support the, um, um, the technology for students to participate? Because one of the goals obviously is to keep that enrollment up and keep those students in in um, in in school so uh, are, are you recommending um, um, more more money be uh, uh, allocated to support um, the technology side for students we would like you we are kind of projecting at this moment and as I say it's it's a moving target because we just got the nominations from, from CCV. Um, coming into this, we thought that the million dollars would be enough, but with these additional nominations that we have received, I think it is you know, very possible that we could go over the 1 million to somewhere um, between one and 1.5 million. Okay, um, okay. I, because um, we just need to give you some guidance. You already have the money. The question mm -hmm. is how it would be sort of allocated. The other part was to do something also, and that was direct student assistance and that um, um, as the um, people in the colleges know, sometimes students really have a car repair or some kind of emergency or food or help with apartment or uh, something falls apart and they need help in order to address it and to stay in school. So a couple of years ago, we allowed a certain amount of the money for BSEC to use to, uh, to address those emergency needs to keep kids um, um, in school and many of them are right on the edge. So um, one of the uh, would be permissible um, would be to uh, do more. And at this point, I think it was a very modest amount, 60,000 or something um, to do more to recognize that if the kids haven't had the same employment this summer um, as they might have normally, that that uh, could mean their emergency needs or their financial situations much more fragile. <laughs> so uh, that's one thing that we need to talk about. And that is, do we want to um, recognize that our students have those emergency needs? We've focused on you know, utilities, we've focused on rent, we've focused on a whole lot of things for emergency needs. So I just wanna throw that out. and. I think what would be helpful, Scott, is if you would provide the committee with just a breakdown of the amount and that what you would like to um, uh, propose to us for how that uh, remainder uh, could be used to support students because that, that has a beneficial impact on our colleges because you want those kids to stay. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So we'd be glad to come back um, take another look at what we're seeing within the emergency grant program um, and within technology and come back um, in the next day or so with a proposal to the committee. Okay. And then the last was just helping buy down some of their debt. Yeah, we have, I think nationally, um, you know, we've all seen the challenges um, that some particular recent graduates um, have had finding jobs and the struggles that they've had paying their student loans. Um, this is, we've been, we at BSAC have been working very, very closely with our borrowers um, to help them with kind of payment relief 
one of the things that several states have done um, in the absence of relief being provided directly by the federal government um, for those non-federally um, owned student loans has been to use a portion of the CARES Act funds uh, to provide um, some relief to those borrowers that are struggling to make payments during the period that they can't make them. Okay, so it'll be helpful and then we can um, consider what we want to do. Um, committee, other questions of any of our witnesses? My goodness. Well, thank you all for um, coming. And um, um, we, have some, we have some work ahead, I guess, before we finish up. Um, and I think um, uh, obviously this is put everything into uncertain territory. So um, if you can, I guess everybody is saying that the money that we've appropriated um, so far, I think UVM um, and the state college system, uh, except for that 23 million, so to speak, that's hanging out there, that sort of appears as though you have something that you may not have, um, that, um, that the appropriations in fact, you will be spent um, by the end of the year. There is nothing that you're gonna leave unexpended to be reallocated. Is that correct? Uh, everybody's shaking their heads. Wendy and Sophie Correct. and Correct. Scott, your question back to us is that 5 million and how we might want to uh, <clears throat> use it to assist students um, um, that we've just talked about in terms of what that uh, allocation might look like. That's, that's correct. And, and in, the, in the spirit of collaboration, making sure that that money is available to be spent. Okay. Yeah. All right, at Center Star. Yeah, I'm just wondering, have, have the, uh, has the university and the state colleges and VSAC, have you been um, pushing our congressional delegation at all in regards to try and uh, loosen up? Uh, there's some Look at the heads nod, Bobby. <laughs> Senator Starr, I just talked to Senator Leahy's office about this this morning. So, and I know that everybody else has been talking to them regularly. We're, we're trying. Yeah. Good. Keep up the good work. Okay. Hmm. And similarly, I have been in conversation with the U.S. Senate Education Committee staff trying to work through some of these issues as well. Good. Yeah, we've we've been in touch with them, but also I would say, I mean, at the at the national level, um, you know, there's there's a huge amount of pressure from higher education institutions in general as well. So it's not just our congressional delegations, but uh, there are other national organizations related to higher education that are making the same pitch. Hmm. Okay. So committee, I think that unless anyone has got further questions or any of the other people who have joined today um, want to make any comments, I'll um, offer that opportunity. I know that um, we have Sharon and we have, uh, we have Tom and... Uh, yeah, you also have Marilyn Carter. And I see Marilyn up in the corner. So I just I, want to I, offer an opportunity. You have a question or comment? Yeah, I, I, since Marilyn is here and we, uh, we did an estimate on the grant program um, for the increase, the other 5 million that was put in, um, how good was our estimate and will there be enough to um, carry the students that we had that have come back to us and said their economic situation is worse. We need, um, we need um, to redo that. Um, how are we doing with that? And um, and and did we um, did we estimate right? So I would say, Rich, that we have four point six million dollars that can be used for those appeals. We've currently spent about one point two million because of the COVID relationship that has to be there, and another three hundred thousand of state appropriated funds for non-COVID appeals that have come in. So um, we estimated that we'd have about 1,500 before the year was over. We have 800 so far. We will receive appeals across the fall semester. If, if it, 
if it runs at all as it has run in years past and you know who knows this year if it's going to run as it has in years past that's a dangerous thing to say but if it does we'll continue to receive them the other thing that we can't predict and no one can is what's going to happen in as the fall unfolds right so Right now, our appeals have been slowing down a little, but we still have 150 more in the pipeline to review. So they're definitely still coming in. People are hearing this message. The average award increase has been slightly over $2,300 for each student who has received an increase in eligibility. So families are incredibly appreciative of this money. Um, they are definitely asking for it, but I would say right now um, that it's, if I, if I had to guess, and I just don't know if this is a good idea or not, I think we may be closer to spending 2 million than 4.6. And I think Scott mentioned that when he first started talking, but it's a, you just don't know what's going to happen this fall semester. What, yeah. you know, my, my, what happens to those kids um, um, in January. Well, that's... Yeah, the second half of their year, um, we've carried, we will have carried those kids through the fall semester, but will that turn into a drop-off in attendance at the state college system where um, the largest majority of those kids are? And as we, I think we heard from the state colleges, filling those seats 76% of their revenue comes from the kids that are in those seats. I think that you've just identified uh, one of those uh, questions that we can't answer. It's an, uh, one of those uh, ill-defined concerns that is hanging out there and we can't, um, there's w the CRF constraints right now without an extension um, are really going to very much constrain what we're able to do if that if that's the reality. I, I think we need to be cognizant of it, but um, at this point, the capacity to uh, address it is, right now we're still struggling to figure out the bridge money. Right. Yeah, and I think the, the fair point there is that our estimates are based on the fact that these funds have to be spent by December 20th. If that deadline were to change, we, would, we might look at those estimates differently. Okay, great. Other comments or questions? Um, Tom, I see you're I, unmuted. Do you have uh, anything you want to no, add? No, nothing, nothing to add. Good conversation, uh, it's an uphill climb. Yeah, I know. Well, you've been around to know you've climbed many hills, so. <laughs> um, we'll join hands and climb together. Sounds like a Von except Trapp for, movie. <laughs> except for Senator Sears, we're always holding hands and jumping off the cliff. So I was thinking of that. I've never seen what budget with this much uncertainty. Um, and it's created by not knowing what people in Washington, D.C. or some refer to them as the administration and the Congress are going to do. Um, and their lack of leadership to bring anything out when one would have expected it months ago uh, has just left us and every other state in the union up in the air. And mm -hmm. so questions that people like Scott and um, UVM and uh, state colleges are asking, you don't have the answer for it. That's true in a lot of state agencies too. <clears throat> so as we look at this uh, budget, um, I would say we're setting ourselves up for one hell of a budget adjustment act in January of 2021. Those of you who are back here then, um, given the races, knows but i think um this will be one of those challenging years where assumptions some will come true and some won't but i i think it's all can be laid at our um, 
that the United States Congress and the presidents have failed the American people and Vermonters miserably. That was a two minute. Um, it it was. And uh, um, uh, if somebody but wants to close true, with something a little more uplifting. Um, um, <laughs> but I, I think what I've said is true, though. Um, I know it's, it's true. Why we're in the position. Um, so I guess that's why this election is going to be um, I know. Uh, maybe a seminal um, election Who, in terms of what direction Congress will take, um, because we're not alone in this. That's the other thing. Other states, other um, large cities are really um, just um, struggling as much as we are. So. Um, let's yeah. hope that we can see some, uh, some kind of uh, fiscal relief and response uh, to where we are. But until that happens, then we're just kind of in this horrible uh, limbo um, uh, situation. So uh, other comments? Otherwise, um, Chrissy said she's gonna see if um, the Department of Labor might be able to come on a little early, but we've taken quite a bit of time from the staff of um, the state college system, university and VSAC. So we do appreciate being your being available today. And Scott, we look forward to the memo regarding your proposal um, on, on the uh, money and how that could be allocated to where you're seeing the need. Thank okay. you very much. Many thanks. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, Chrissy, I don't know, did you hear back from um, Department of Labor? No, I have not heard back yet, but I did not uh, reach out to them about 10 minutes ago to see if they could hop on a bit earlier. Okay, um, well, if they can, then we'll put them on as soon as they get here. I have a, uh, just uh, wanted to talk to the committee and that has to do with our two public hearings. Uh, we got, um, Senator Ash, are you, talking to your Frankie or, <laughs> or, or making some kind of, oh, well, my question has to do about the public. I'm resorting use. to, you know, the baseball pitchers, you know, they oh. now, they have to cover their mouth when oh. they're. I see. Um, and that is the amount of time these hearings are gonna take. We got information that we're supposed to uh, sign on an hour ahead. Um, and then we've got, um, uh, uh, well, they, the most we can have are 40 witnesses. And for one, I think there's a 30 something and close to 30 for the other. Um, so my question is, um, do, uh, are all members available? Do we want to uh, um, sort of divvy it up and do four and four um, uh, for each of the hearings, just in terms of your time demands? Um, the House, we're doing it jointly with the House, um, but um, I, I, was, I, I was not aware that we had to sign on an hour ahead until we got that um, email. Well, what they said was you got to sign on, but then you can just leave it on hold for, you know, for the hour. You don't yeah. have to sit there for the No, hour. that's true. They said we could go about our work. They're letting yeah. us do that? Oh. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're letting us, okay, that's that. Nice of, that's nice of them to let us yeah. go do something else. For so us. my question to the committee is, um, um, is every, if, are you available for both hearings or do you have a conflict and so just, just for our own planning purposes? I have a conflict Thursday night. Thursday night, okay. Chrissy, are you kind of keeping track of this? Yeah, I'm taking notes. I okay, need to know thank you. Who, who is host, who is the chair of these hearings? I think um, Kitty will be. Ooh, that's good. I'm available both nights, both. All right, thank you, Alice. Can I speak? Um, at, can I be one of the speakers? I, I... <laughs> Senator McCormick. Yeah, um, I, I wonder if we. I wonder if we, if we have a conflict. My calendar shows that our regular committee meeting uh, tomorrow is from 2 to 4.30. And then the public hearing starts at 5. So if 
we're signing on an hour ahead, it's at four o'clock, which means I, I, I'd have to sign out of the committee meeting and Can just have the, the iPad inactive for an hour. I think that would be true. We'd have to wrap up Senate appropriations by four with this new protocol of logging in an hour early. All right. So you need to yeah. look at the schedule and yeah. Um, yes. Senator <laughs> Ash, you wanted There's to just know. There's no way we have to be this on is, an hour early for this to this work. Is I mean, just ridiculous. let's have the, the committee should be meeting. That is the priority. And then we log on when we log on. It'll work out. Who, who made that rule? Um, the IT folks say they need it. Uh, Teresa sent an explanation that you received about how they have to uh, get people into the rooms. And it, because it's a webinar, it's not just our Zoom conferencing. Uh, don't ask me to explain it. You know, I'm hardly the most uh, savvy tech person here. Yeah. Um, so Senator technology. So my question Wait, is, why are you on the Joint Technology Committee if you don't know anything about technology? Because you put me on. <laughs> <laughs> why don't you ask yourself that question, Mr. You're doing Protan. a great job, though. Thanks. Uh, they love me there. Um, well, the second hearing is, is at night as well? No. No, no the second one is a Friday <laughs> afternoon. Friday at one. Well, we, have that, we, have a, we have a similar conflict, though, which is that we're scheduled to have our regular committee meeting until a half an hour before the public hearing. Well, Chrissy, so we'll, have to, on we'll have to adjust for that. Yeah, do, I, I will yeah. make sure we adjust for that. Okay. Is there anyone else who can't make the hearing? Uh, Senator Ash wants to testify, so we'll put him down for 30 seconds. Only if, uh, if <laughs> Representative Toll is the host i would like to say <laughs> you can't torment her tim no uh, i won't um it'll be a final oh, opportunity i'm not sure i fully understand I, I still don't know i fully understand what the point of the hearings is we've already had hearings on this budget haven't we not on the uh restated budget but from the point of view of the lobbyists it's about the same isn't it I can't speak for the lobbyists. What we're not having a special. They don't care about vacancy <laughs> savings. They don't care well, about travel being cut back. I mean, they might be. Uh, I would think the CRF proposals would be one area that people would have not had a chance to. Um, so we've offer. asked them to weigh in on the CRF funds as well. It's part as of the budget. budget. The governor's budget includes it. So, yes. Well, I think it's a mistake, but oh, whatever. I think Timothy's being difficult. No, as usual. No, no, because we've got we're going to have people weighing in. For instance, in favor of the thirty million for the state colleges, not understanding that it's not even an allowed use. So it's we're not going to have the chance to educate people that the proposal as it stands isn't workable, and so it creates this almost uh, yeah. theatrical. So can we element. ask them what they'd like us to cut? but we can't ask during a public hearing. They only have two minutes and they just state what's important to them. And then we'll do like we always do and that we have to set the priorities. So um, I, I think we have that every year. Uh, anyway, we're committed, they're on the um, and they're scheduled. So um, I'm going to, at this point, we'll have to accept um, what has been scheduled um, is it, it is on the restatement. And is it airing on YouTube or what's the way it's going it, to? It's going to be a webinar. It's a Zoom webinar. That is and not going I, to be carried live on YouTube as far as you're aware? It will I believe be carried it live will be. on YouTube. It will be on YouTube. So it's just like any public hearing. People will come and they will have two minutes and we'll have a timekeeper. And it's the same as the ones that we have had um, around the state, only um, we're doing it remotely. Before we move uh, on, I ju I'd just like to raise a practical question for future Zoom meetings, because we're starting to see this play out. Whenever the meetings are on YouTube, of course, we're in the Zoom room being attentive to the issues. There are chat functions going on on the YouTube link. 
And people have a right to do that, but that then becomes the official place where people will go forever to look at the proceedings of a meeting with unfiltered uh, commentary being offered by different individuals, sometimes with information that's not accurate. And I, I think what's gonna happen is there are gonna be legislators who are gonna sort of be taking a pass on actually being an active participant. And they're gonna be in there jockeying around with commenters on YouTube, but that's just something I'd say to file away for because- Well, then I'd be concerned about that if that becomes part of the official record because it's not part of the official record. And so I, I think we have well, to- you, But that's YouTube's issue, not we, our, we can't- um, It's Chrissy here. We do have the ability to turn off chat. So I can talk to Teresa that is recorded. Um, it's only the folks that are testifying, but we do have an ability to turn chat off. On YouTube? Uh, well, no, on Zoom is where it shows up. You, they can chat separately on YouTube? Yes. Oh, okay. So that's a YouTube thing. I'll it's, just worth, it's worth people thinking about because what will happen, and we know this when you know some legislators are on Facebook during committee meetings and dealing with real-time stuff, it's going to become an issue with, with in the future with legislators in real time, some legislators in real time being on YouTube, engaging with people who are commenting while the rest of the people are actively doing the committee work. And it will have implications because people don't understand that the commentary on YouTube doesn't necessarily reflect, it's not necessarily accurate or- It's not the official record and it may not be accurate. I think that's uh, something we need to explore. All right, Chrissy, that's something you will do. I see that we have uh, um, the folks from Department of Labor here. So why don't we um, um, uh, go into their section of the budget and um, not keep them waiting. They were, uh, they were kind enough to come early, but it's we're only two minutes uh, early. So um, with that, um, I'm going to um, ask the commissioner in terms of the budget, in terms of the uh, restated budget. Um, also, as you can imagine, um, there's been a, a concern about the, um, the problems with the, the UI system and delays and so forth. So I'm sure it'll be kind of a free floating conversation, but if you um, could at least speak to uh, the restated budget and it, whether it has any impact in terms of what you would be proposing versus what the governor um, proposed to us in January. So Commissioner Harrington, welcome. Thank you for coming. Great. Thank you for having us uh, with me. I've got our CFO, Chad Wozniak, who's not a stranger to any of you. Um, and uh, he can help provide any context or additional details. One second here while we get rid of an echo. Great. So uh, uh, we were asked to propose or repropose our budget with a slight decrease uh, in the general fund, uh, which uh, we strategically went through our budget to identify um, points Just where we could pull that information. Um, yes, ma'am. Every if members of the committee, if you could go on mute, maybe that's maybe we're contributing to the to the feedback. Um, <laughs> Um, Senator Starr, it's if you would mute, things. if you would mute, just because we're getting feedback, I think maybe that will help. Okay, do you want to try again or, um, Chad, you seem to have two heads there. We're just trying to make sure we can get rid of the feedback here while trying to keep some, some respectful distance. Uh, is that better for you, Madam Chair? Uh, yes, yes, it seems to have. Great. Solved it. Great. Um, so uh, again, it, what you have in front of you is likely two documents we provided, um, and one gives a little more detail than the other. But we identified three specific areas uh, that included a slight reduction um, from uh, the originally proposed budget. And that includes um, about $8,700 out of our um, uh, administrative services line. I should start by saying, in total, the Department of Labor uh, only uh, uh, accounts for about 
$5,411,000 in general fund money. Um, so when we're talking about a 3% reduction, we're looking at a total of $162,335 um, that we identified through a variety of programs, one being our administrative services with a slight reduction, some ICANN money, which is some workforce development money um, that was used to administer a grant program. Uh, there was a reduction in the grant, uh, the overall federal grant. Uh, so we were able to remove some of the overhead costs uh, out of the administrative line for that grant. Uh, and then we also looked at um, some uh, decrease in our wage and hour and earned sick time. Uh, those are specific to the fact that um, we've uh, just been able to realize a little bit of vacancy savings there. Um, and traditionally, that fund also has just a slight um, uh, uh, amount of money left over at the end of, of a typical fiscal year. So um, combined with the vacancy savings, we were able to take out about 50000 out of that line. And then a slight reduction in our overall um, administrative subsidies and budget allowances. So the total obviously being the 162335 uh, in general fund money. Um, so we can talk about any of those specifically or anything else about the budget, or I can talk a little bit about the other items you mentioned. Um, I think you're because you're so predominantly um, funded um, by federal dollars, as you say, the, the general fund uh, is very, very um, small. And so it's and then you had some internal service fund reductions, the 5 percent as well, that would have contributed to it toward that, which we've seen in all the budgets. Um, any Correct. questions about, uh, about the uh, restated budget um, that the commissioner has said is uh, a, a slight reduction in the general fund? Yes, Alice. I just wanna say for the public hearing, the public out there hearing that there's um, vacancy savings going on, I would think they would be very upset because of the, you know, the huge issues that happened and are still going on with regard to adjudicators. So I think, you know, people says vacancy savings at this point, but I mean, I understand what you're doing. But. Well, and I, I would say that's not, those aren't necessarily planned vacancy savings. Um, you know, it may have been based on um, either the fact that we had a new employee come in at a lower pay rate, um, or in this case, there may have been a position that was just open for a few months while we were, were filling a position. But this fund typically has a little, um, a little wiggle room in it, depending on um, how the year shakes out. Uh, so that's where we were able to find about 50000 uh, Senator Ash, your hands up. Yes. So, uh, Commissioner, in the budget itself, the language we received, there's grayed out language, meaning that it's no longer being requested. And it relates to a series of transfers that I think are under the rubric of the next gen funds. Mm -hmm. and you just explain what, what the, it, it, the, the expl explanation on the bottom of it, I'm drawing from memory here, says something like not needed anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. the transfer piece. So can you just explain yeah. what's going on there? Sure. And, and Chad can talk a little bit more about the timeline, but I think it was about a year ago now in the previous budget, those next gen or uh, wet fund as they are also called uh, workforce education and training fund dollars were actually moved into the department of labor's base budget. Um, so those actually appear within our, our detailed budget um, at the bottom under workforce education and training fund. So that's the, the no longer needed was simply, um, because it is included in, in our base budget. That's helpful. Um, can, do you have any insights into, you know, when we think about what the federal government might do in terms of stimulus, we hear about things like broadband and infrastructure and different sorts. Is there anything in the workforce uh, category that seems to have legs that you're hearing about in Washington that this budget might be wise to anticipate? From a federal perspective, I'll be honest, um, most communications and um, 
comments are around unemployment insurance. Um, however, I think one that remains at the top of the list specific to workforce development is apprenticeship uh, money um, for the expanding of apprenticeship programs. Um, so um, I would certainly anticipate that um, there may be additional federal money for um, apprenticeship programs. I have a feeling, it, you know, if we, if I'm reading the the crystal ball. I mean, I can't imagine that states wouldn't also see an increase in their dislocated worker fund. Um, and so that are that is dollars, federal dollars that come to us through the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act uh, and others um, that are specific for employees who have been, um, you know, laid off either temporarily or, or permanently displaced. Uh, and so I would imagine there'd be additional funds there. Okay. I'm not sure any of that necessarily has a bearing on what is specifically laid out in this program, unless um, Chad, you know, feel free to um, provide any color uh, to that. Uh, uh, the, the only thing I can say about that is I personally, from the, the CFO office, have heard um, not a single word on what's going on for the new budget year out of the federal government. So um, right now it's a bit of a mystery to, to me as to, to what will happen. Um, I am anticipating lots of changes in the UI world and um, I would anticipate um, some changes in the WIOA funding of which the, the dislocated worker that uh, Commissioner Harrington just spoke of, I would imagine that has, um, we'll, we'll see some, some changes or some increases as well. Um, and apprenticeship, apprenticeship has been a focus for uh, several years now, so I, I would expect that would continue to be a focus. Are, are there any requests from the administration to our congressional delegation related to these things? Uh, not at this time, and, and I don't think that's anything other than, um, you know, we, I think we typically hear of comment um, or, or are asked to provide comment to our congressional delegation. Uh, I think most recently the feedback we've given has been around UI modernization. Um, but there, again, that goes back a few months now. So, um, you know, there may be another opportunity, I'm assuming, coming up where we could provide some additional uh, comment or recommendation for funding. Um, uh, and I would also uh, say that, you know, I can follow up with our workforce development director. You all know uh, Sarah Buxton and and see if she's hearing uh, other comments um, either at the, the state level or, or the federal level. OK, now I'll, I'll, this is my last comment. I, I do think because it, it would be wise, I think, to anticipate funds. I, I, the worst, not the worst case outcome, but I think a very inefficient outcome would be the feds just pump up WIOA funding and we're back in the same, you know, trap of not being able to use the funds because the population we have doesn't quite match these bureaucratic requirements from Washington. So now's the time to try to seek maximum flexibility if they're going to jack up the amount of money that comes for some of these programs so we can actually use them for the people we have in Vermont, not the people they have in Des Moines or, you know, early primary states. Um, Thank you. I think, um, I would think that out of all the um, competing interests, uh, the, the state the state of, not a, a geopolitical um, state, but the state <laughs> of the UI systems around the country, um, when we see the lines in Florida, when we see uh, the difficulties that uh, people are having accessing um, uh, these benefits, um, it's hard to fathom that a, a program that has had such a historical federal presence um, that something won't be done to address uh, the plight of so many unemployed uh, around the country. Um, so, uh, one would hope that perhaps if there's anything that comes um, out of this long-term benefit would be the money to modernize these systems that um, many states have that are pretty antiquated. But I will say that, um, yeah, no, it's, I, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I was just gonna say that in the, um, the last uh, proposed um, stimulus package that got hung up uh, at the federal level um, and hasn't 
come through yet, um, did include some significant money uh, for state UI modernization. Okay. Uh, other uh, questions about, and not the budget, because the budget's pretty straightforward. If more federal money comes in, of course, we can accept it through, um, through the normal process. But um, uh, if not, then we can talk about uh, where things stand relative to uh, the UI system. I know that you're coming into joint fiscal committee tomorrow um, to get approval for a $35 million grant. So um, perhaps we can um, have some discussion around that. My first question really, um, and that is taking on this new program and what it will take to do, um, how will that compromise um, the several thousand cases that you've still got left to adjudicate that it seemed to be really complicated and people are saying they aren't getting callbacks and um, there's been no, no resolution. Will we see further um, um, negative impact on the department's ability to start getting some of those cases resolved and out of queue? Uh, so I, I don't want to say there'll be no impact. I mean, I, maybe what is important for me to just highlight while I have a second is some of the mitigation efforts we've put in place in adjudication. So um, we have, uh, we started prior to COVID with probably about eight adjudicators, um, maybe as low as seven. Um, we've, we're now up to 15 and a half adjudicators. Um, the the seven or eight original ones, uh, five and a half that have been reassigned from other departments. We have a couple new uh, adjudicators that have joined us. We also have um, six additional temporary hires that will start uh, next week. We have two additional vacant positions that are under recruitment. Um, and uh, you probably heard during the last press conference, we also are onboarding um, a team of fact finders uh, from um, our vendor that can help with the, the compiling of the necessary information, whether it be you know attestations from the employee or the job seeker, the claimant, um, or the employer, or, or um, compiling documentation that they provide and putting it together in a packet so our adjudicators um, under the program can focus on, uh, you know, expediting decisions and getting uh, determinations out the door. Um, so from that perspective, you know, I, our capacity will be um, growing greatly just in the next two weeks. Um, we also uh, are are looking at different enhancements to our claimant portals to help. So what happens is, you know, from a claimant's perspective, whether it's their initial claim that they're opening or their weekly filing claim, um, if they select an option on that, on either one of those, they can, um, you know, indicate a, and, and cause a determination of ineligibility that causes them to go into adjudications. Um, and, uh, and, so th and that can happen repeatedly since people file each week. So you could have somebody that their claim continually goes into adjudications um, because of how they filed um, uh, each week over and over again if we aren't able to correct the way they're either answering the question or provide the documentation to get them through that process. Um, I, so I think from that perspective, we are looking at a variety of different ways to streamline our process. We also have a, um, uh, a process improvement uh, professional um, that is being reassigned to us in two weeks from the Agency of Transportation on a, on a temporary basis to take a look at our processes to see where um, there are pinch points in the process or duplicative efforts or waste, uh, whether that be time and effort or, or whatnot. So um, we are also looking at different ways to streamline um, the process. So to, to get to your original question, this new program, there is the ability for individuals to um, appeal determinations. However, the only um, part that will likely be adjudicated um, is if they cause an issue on their claim as they as part of their normal filing. So I don't think we'll see an, an increase 
in issues um, because it are, it includes people who have already been filing. So if they fill out their claim a certain way that causes it to go to adjudications, um, then uh, and, and that could be something like someone reports severance pay um, or someone uh, indicates that they um, quit or were fired. Um, there's about seven, uh, 17, 15, 12 different um, possibilities that could cause a case to go to adjudication. So, um, so I don't think there'll be an increase in adjudications, but we do we are required to afford them the opportunity uh, of due process and they can appeal um, determinations based Alice, on the crisis. So just, uh, Senator um, Nitka. I, I'm glad to hear you mention the quit or be fired. Just, um, you know, we're having to talk to a lot of people on email about what where what status they are and the terrible lament they're having. But um, one recent person said they 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 put in fired they they weren't fired they were laid off and they didn't quit but they said they didn't see where there was any option for them to put that in so they put in fired and of course they then went to adjudication i don't know if they're doing that or if that even happens every week but is that really the case that they can't find the were laid off so so there are two pieces there one is um on the initial application, when they open uh, their their initial claim, there is an option for selecting laid off. Um, and so that uh, indicates that they were laid off. When they go to file their weekly claim, and I think what's happening here is if you read the print at the top, if you actually read the step-by-step -step instructions, it says, please answer the following questions pertaining to this specific week, right? So what happened, you know, what they should be saying is, were you fired or did you quit for the week in which you're filing, right? Not way back in the beginning when you opened your claim, but for the, you know, did you lose another job? Did you quit another job? Essentially, those are federally mandated questions to determine eligibility. So really what they should be saying is no to all of them because their status hasn't changed in the week in which they're filing for. Um, that, but that's a great example of where I think we can identify enhancements to our claim and portal just to make that more clear and apparent to people. That would be good. Okay, thank you, that's good. Yes, ma'am. Other questions, Senator McCormick? Thanks, though, uh, Senator Nitka just addressed my question. Um, I have a question, um, and I'm really not sure what we should do. For those of us who have received emails um, from applicants, and some it'll be three months, and you know they've, they've gotten a call, and then it's been a week or, or weeks, and there's been no contact back. What do you have for a tracking system? I'm, uh, and I, I don't know what to do uh, um, to, to help people. I suppose I can send them to Kendall, um, but um, my attempts to refer them to the department, um, I, I, I assume is just because people are so overloaded and that gets into what you have for staffing. So for those of us, and I think we all are, um, some of these um, applications are in fact, people have gone without income for uh, several months. Um, is, is there, do you rec what do you recommend uh, we do to assist people who are in that, that, uh, um, that where they might have really yep. complex cases and I understand that they just don't fall in. And, you know, as I said yesterday, the other day, the algorithms, you know, it's really easy. You've got an employer that got laid off, et cetera, and your wage data is there. They're not that straightforward. Um, yep. what, sh what should, what do you advise us to do? And how do you ha keep track of those cases that in fact are very, um, uh, long-term impending and um, how do how do you plan to get them caught up? So it, it really depends on the case, but I will say um, we recognize that um, so back uh, when uh, Maximus took over our call center operations and probably up until maybe two months ago, 
Um, you know, we they they would try to resolve an issue, and then if they couldn't resolve it, they would add that person to what they called an escalation log, and they would send that escalation log to the department. Um, however, some of these escalation logs were coming through with hundreds, if not thousands of people on them. Um, I think what we have done recently actually, and have a much better system in place, um, is that you may remember, and I believe I've sent a letter, but I'll make sure that I, I get this information to you, that we have what we call the claim and inquiry tool. So it is actually a way for any claimant, regardless of whether they've been determined eligible, ineligible, if they filed or have never filed, they can log in with their information and they can submit an issue um, for one of our UI specialists uh, to complete. Um, now, we we are not trying to broadcast that link um, because we're really trying to hone in on those more difficult or compact, complex cases, so not to overload our system. So the first method should be for people to call our, our claim center. I would also say many people, um, and, and again, this is not a justification. I recognize that this is an area where, um, you know, we fell short early on is that, um, you know, many people called our claim center probably months ago and were told they were going to get a call back and they didn't get a call back or told their issue had been escalated and it either didn't get escalated or something happened. So, um, you know, we have tried to go back in time as much as we could to go through those lists to get back to people. But I would encourage them if they if they're listening to this presentation today, um, if they haven't heard back um, and are still waiting, they should call the claimant center again uh, in the sense that if if the claimant center is now under um, strict guidance from the department that they have 24 hours to resolve a claimant's issue. And if they can't resolve that issue within 24 hours, they have to submit on behalf of the claimant uh, one of these claim issue reports for one of our specialists um, to, you know, to resolve or handle. Um, I, we have also provided that link um, to legislators so that they can hand out that link to the claimant to either fill out or they can fill out the link on the claimant's behalf, you know, if the claimant is okay with that. So there are a couple different methods there should someone run into an issue. Um, you know, some of you are reaching out to either myself or, or our legislative assistant, Amanda Wheeler, um, you know, on kind of these very unique or complex cases. And, and to be honest, every time I get one of those, I say, thank you very much for submitting it or sending it to me, because some of these truly, you know, we've got two systems that are trying to pass information back and forth. They're looking at multiple checkpoints and determinations. Um, they're actually moving through three systems if you count the adjudications and four if you count the appeals process. You know, so again, there there is that possibility that data gets lost in the transfer of either either the human transfer or the technical transfer. Um, so, you know, anytime you're hearing of somebody who hasn't been able to get their issue resolved in a matter of, you know, two weeks, we'd like to know about it. Um, and so if there's someone who's still hanging out there, um, that's, you know, over two weeks, months, you know, whatever, you know, please either have them fill out that inquiry tool. We're typically able to resolve um, issues that come in through our inquiry tool in about 10 days or less. Um, and we actually have a team of people that we've reassigned to handle those cases. They should, you know, if they're not going through, um, one of you, or if they're not going through some other at predetermined avenue, they should simply just call our claim center back. Um, and if they can't resolve it in 24 hours, they have been instructed to provide us with the details so we can resolve it. So you're going to send, well, you send that information. Uh, yeah, well, I'm like, oh my gosh. Yes, I will. Okay. I will um, send it directly to you. All right. Well, um, okay. And then um, Chrissy can send it out to the committee to Sure. So that we've got it. Um, Senator Starr, you had your hand up. You're muted. Yes, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to uh, let Michael know, and you as well, uh, when I had calls from constituents, um, I finally got hooked up with Cameron Brown 
uh, at UI and Cameron Wood, did, maybe. Um, I mean, Cameron Wood, and he did an excellent job. Uh, you know, would get back to people or have somebody get back to them. People had been waiting for three or four weeks, and it, it really worked very well, I think. Uh, so if we get that link, uh, if we get that link and that's working decent, it should should help. Other comments? No. Um, okay. So the budget itself is pretty straightforward and um, 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 the UI is um, still a work in progress. Okay. Yeah, I, I would add, uh, just so the committee is aware, um, you know, regardless of, of what we're going through right now and, and the need to upgrade our system, um, we have started uh, a comprehensive uh, RFI request for information and RFP request for proposal process. Um, so we do have uh, our team working with ADS resources um, to come to do the the comprehensive business requirements gathering process, uh, and in the effort of moving towards a, a request for information uh, from possible uh, vendors. Um, or contractors, um, but I think once we get that RFI information and can compile that into a report, um, you know, we can come back to the legislature with an idea of, of what a modernized solution would look like in terms of not only functionality, um, but cost and also uh, the timeline for implementation. And then I think that, you know, the tough question is going to have to be um, at, at our level, the state level is, you know, are we are we wanting to move forward, um, you know, with state dollars or with federal dollars if and when they become available, right? And that's not an, an answer we have to figure out now, but, um, you know, should we get to that point and if there is no, um, there are no federal dollars uh, assigned for modernization, then we just have a decision to make as to whether to wait or to move forward on our own. And we can talk about that when we're when we're there. Okay, I have, I, my screen indicates that I have two people who have their hands raised. Um, Senator McCormick, are you one of them? Yeah, okay. yes, thanks. All right. Uh, and this is, this is not about your leadership because the problem in question predates you. <clears throat> but we had, had got testimony, I think it was just yesterday, describing labor's uh, computer system as, as being reminiscent of, of old pictures of the Sputnik Control Center. <laughs> that is, uh, now, so it looks like that you really kind of need to update. <laughs> yeah. There, there are positives and negatives um, to both. Obviously, the right now, the negatives outweigh the positives, um, you know, but but there, is, there are some silver linings to having a 50-year-old system. Uh, the system did, um, just in case anybody's interested, um, it did turn 50 years old on June 9th of this year. Um, we were a little busy, so we didn't hold a birthday party uh, or anniversary, but, um, you know, it, it is at that, that time, so. Um, Senator Ash, you were the second person? Yeah, Commissioner, I'm wondering, um, Sir Vermont, I don't believe has any direct connection to the Department of Labor. And I'm wondering if you think now's the time to bring that under the Department of Labor's auspices, since many of the skills that people uh, develop while doing some of the AmeriCorps and other functions are complementary to what mm -hmm. The various WIOA funded programs and other labor programs do so that there would not be one place off in a mystery office and then all of the other places for people to develop. And I know that there are people who do some things like medical work who are maybe go under the service, under the Serve Vermont thing, but I feel like Serve Vermont is an un. un under doesn't have very high name recognition amongst the public. And at a time when we're trying to have a sort of more 
coherent pipeline for skill development. I, I hope you'll do some thinking about whether this budget should fold them under the Department of Labor. Um, Senator Ash, for those of us um, who are trying to put some context in, around, is this a federally funded program and where is its organizational home? Sir Vermont used to be called something else. Uh, this corporation for service, national service in Vermont or something. It's the AmeriCorps like uh, overseers or something. Uh, Did that used to be run out of the governor's office? It is Vermont's state service commission uh, under the Clinton era uh, AmeriCorps stuff uh, created when Governor Dean was in in 93, three full-time staff members, AmeriCorps grants, compliance with federal regulations, working to expand opportunities to serve in Vermont, et cetera, et cetera. Hmm. It, I just looked it up online. Um, it falls under the Agency of Human Services um, out of the secretary's office. I don't know anything more other than, than what's up here, but um, you know, I appreciate the comment, not anything I was really on my radar, but happy to, happy to consider it and, and um, you know, at least do some digging. So thank you. Thanks. I think that probably ties into an ongoing conversation about um, different workforce programs and where they're located and how they coordinate and how people know about them. Yeah. Okay. Other uh, questions? If not, um, I'm, I'm going to uh, let the folks get back to um, their work and the committee then I think, uh, Chrissy, we're done. Is that right for today? We are done for today, but I did want to give the committee a, a bit of an update on um, the public hearings, if I can just Okay, why don't we do that? And uh, so Department of Labor folk, if you wanna, um, you're welcome to listen, but I expect you've probably got other demands on your time. So thank you very much for coming today. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. And, and just let me say, I, I truly appreciate everybody's support over the past six months or so. Um, we'll continue to work through this, but um, know that we've got uh, partners in each of you helping us out. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So now we'll get to the um, uh, instructions about our hearing from Chrissy. Yes, I did get confirmation from IT that they can shut off YouTube chat. So they have it. Um, you know, they know that we zoom into the meeting. The first thing they do is they disable it. So that will not happen for our public hearings. So they're on that and they're actually going to be in the room with us behind the scenes. So that can be turned off. So hopefully that alleviates that concern. And then in terms of logging on an hour early, I did just review the agenda and we should be fine. You have um, testimony from public service at three and I don't uh, anticipate it going longer than four. Um, it seems like it, we've been sticking close to an hour so that we can adjourn at four. You guys can log on in the background and then the public hearing will start at five. And the same is for Friday. We don't start the public hearing until one. So if you can log in at noon, I don't believe you have anything scheduled in terms of committee time. So we're on, we're on the floor at 11.30. You're on the floor at 11.30? But Tim. I don't think it will be on very long. Okay. Tim, do you, what do you, what's your sense about floor? We have not yet received word from us, any chairs that they have bills to take up this week. The only action I think we'll take is tomorrow. I'm gonna move to refer some bills back to committees uh, an example would be the hemp resolution because Bobby already covered that from his committee in another bill, the food residuals in another bill. There's a transportation one, which is in another bill. There's the state house paintings in another bill. So just to clear them off the calendar, some of them are taking up, you know, lots of space and bills that aren't going to happen um, just to winnow that down. But Friday we should have It'll be like today was, I think um, John Bloomer said he messed up that they were supposed to send an email out to everyone alerting you to not even bother going because it was going to be a token, but they, they did. Made they a did. Mistake. Yeah. But only, was, only, I, ha only half the people received it though. So oh, oh, for the oh. meeting. Right. Oh. So it's, it, I think Friday will be exactly the same way. 
Okay. okay. Oh. Great. Then I think we should be okay for public hearings. And again, I apologize for the inconvenience of having to log in that hour earlier. Um, it just Did you confirm that that is actually required? I have asked. I don't have an actual information, but I will continue to inquire. Did you already sent out the Zoom uh, numbers on those? Those are going to come from Teresa. She is uh, managing logistics on the hearing, so you'll be getting the Zoom um, invites from her if you haven't already. We don't have them. Okay, this I'll touch base with her. We're the, going to connect actually after this meeting. The hour isn't Chrissy or Teresa's fault. It's IT is insisting on it. Um, right, and we'll 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 get to the bottom of it because it sounds like this might be something we'll be doing. You know, well, I think if you know in the future any public hearings will be difficult when people have to give an extra hour, um, you know, to log in ahead of time and then be without that device for an hour. Yeah, understood. That would be a relief. <laughs> well, you can log in and swim. Um, okay. I guess. Well, yeah. Um, well, not today. Uh, so um, are we, can we um, adjourn the committee meeting um, right now uh, and uh, stop recording?